he defines fear, he d- defines degrees of fear, and ultimately tells us that fear is something that exists primarily in the imagination, because fear is regarding the future. You can't fear something that has happened in the past, although you can, but it it is just metaphysically something that's concerned with the future. So by that very fact, it's not real. Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. We call these special editions, The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. Peace be with you. That is the name of the book and the sentiment of our show today here on The Way is Love podcast. Who isn't searching for peace daily in these times? It seems that less and less of what we are presented with involves the peace and tenderness of heart that humanity needs in the times we are living through. The book, Peace Be With You, by Father Narcisco Irala, is just what one might be looking for. If you like manuals and books that give you concrete instructions on helping yourself and other people, then revisit this volume, originally published in 1969. But we've evolved so much since then, you might be saying. Reading through this volume, I really felt a call back to action. I like a book that has a pragmatic approach and a formula for happiness at its onset. It's refreshing to read a book that has quotes like this one. Every morning, says the Doctor of Gentleness St. Francis de Sales, prepare your soul for a tranquil day. Peace Be With You is published by Sophia Press, and here to speak with me about it today is Kristen Van Uden. Welcome, Kristen Van Uden, to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me back, David. Yeah, it's been wonderful. This volume that we're going to be looking at today was really interesting. And uh, the author, of course, is a Catholic priest. And his book is this product of years of experience, both as a priest and a practicing psychologist. That's right. Yeah, Father Narciso Arala was actually, as you said, a practicing psychologist and a Jesuit. So he has this combined combination of experience from the confessional and understanding the human soul and also understanding how that plays out in the mind and in the emotions. Yeah. And, you know, the book was written in 1969. So we'll just make it very clear. It's not a new book. You know, it didn't come out last week. But as I went through it, uh, I just found it had so much relevant teaching. Um, What struck you as you revisited his teaching? Absolutely. I thought reading this that it had been written yesterday because it was just so relevant to everything we hear today, particularly with the rise of certain therapies. So he has a section on concentration that I found very fascinating where he speaks about pure concentration as necessary interspersed with periods of pure rest. And he gives us these exercises, which we can get into, of concentrating and not only mentally, but also grounding yourself in your environment around you. I was like, hey, that sounds like cognitive behavioral therapy that we're all pretty familiar with, right? So these ideas that, you know, the 20th century was when psychology as a field really took off and he was present sort of riding that wave and it's interesting that he he starts the book by discussing the stresses of the nuclear age and how it is uh of course dealing with the fear of impending death every day during the cold war but also the rise of technology and how it had made life so much more hectic and i think we especially see that taken to its logical conclusion today and uh, it could always get worse but Uh, I think if he were still alive today, he would be horrified by the way technology has not only completely decreased our attention spans, but also has just made us, on the whole, more depressed, more atomized and disconnected from from reality. So a lot of these principles, he was sort of on the forefront of diagnosing and understanding. And today, when we see them in our lives, his, his advice is still applicable. Yeah, I'm sure that he would be prescribing media fasting today, just as many people (laughs) did over this past Lent that I know. So it's kind of like this is a self-help book before self-help books became a thing, 
what do you think he recognized the world needed? I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but what do you think he recognized the world needed when, when he wrote this book? He recognized that the world needed God, first of all. So I like how you talk of this as a self-help book because it really is. But as Catholics, we often struggle finding good self-help books, right? Because most of them do not take into account faith at all, the supernatural realm at all. And if they do, then often we have the risk of falling into breaking the first commandment by yeah. <laughs> when you get halfway through a meditation and realize, oh, wait, like this, <laughs> now they're invoking spirits, like what is going on? So he he really fills that gap. And even before this genre had took, taken off, the idea of a book that is grounded in science and in psychology, but also recognizes the truth of the Catholic faith and the need to have a spiritual component to any sort of mental health program because you're treating the holistic person and you're maintaining the mental health of a holistic person. So I think that's where it's really unique. I so agree because it doesn't always take that into account and people bring their faith to that process. Um, mm-hmm. But And there's one quote I just want to read here, which I really sure. liked. Uh, So, open quote, and we must live goodness. This is an active process, loving others and making them happy, loving God above all. There's also a passive aspect to it, feeling the love and goodness of others and the love of God pouring itself out upon us. That's just like a small little window into these gems that Uh, you find throughout this book and I can't believe I'd never heard of it or come across it before and I'm so Mm -hmm. glad Sophia Institute decided to republish this volume but I just want to get into a little talk about virtue because you know that is sort of moving towards being virtuous and living a virtuous life which we strive to do why do you think they're the cornerstones to happiness So basically, without virtue, our souls will never be purely healthy or happy. And we must recognize first that happiness is primarily a spiritual good. And our true happiness will come through making it to heaven and beholding the beatific vision. So Father emphasizes throughout the book, emphasizing spiritual goods over physical goods, over that of this world, and how in his chapter on remedies for sadness, we as Christians can even consider bad things that occur to us on earth as future spiritual goods due to our ability to unite them to Christ's suffering. So he uses that as a framework and how a life without virtue is essentially a hedonistic self-centered life. So virtue is not only metaphysically correct in the supernatural order, but also is oriented towards others. So we often hear in modern psychology that one of the ways to cure depression is to get out of your own head, essentially. One of is to think of others, perform some sort of act of charity, and just basically put your own life and thoughts in perspective. And Father Irala actually gives us an interesting formula for happiness right at the beginning of the book. So he um, tells us of a few attributes of true happiness, which he identifies as noble, So it's true satisfaction is not to be found in vice or anything degrading or any illicit pleasures, he says. Second, happiness is altruistic. So again, oriented towards the other. Finally, happiness is calm and collected. So he juxtaposes this to the intense feelings that come with pleasure or infatuation or other hedonistic pursuits of on earth how true happiness is a joy that's anchored deep in the soul and often does not feel exciting in the same way. And then he also emphasizes that happiness is not controlled by external events. So Mm. this is tough to to overcome because of course we're affected by what, what happens to us. But we, this is again where he is predicting the, the phrases of modern psychology, but from a Catholic perspective where he says that happiness is not found but made. And that really, we hear the echoes of that in you make your own happiness. Happiness is a choice. Happiness is a state of mind. Yeah. He really, he realizes, you know, that you have to be active in your happiness and you have to participate in it. And 
You know, the one thing I realized early on is this book is just so considerate and it shows a real gentleness in its approach. So he asks the reader at some points to just to go slowly prior to certain pages that describe illness because he realizes some people could be, to use a modern term, triggered by reading something like that. So he gives you like these small warnings where in our culture, we've just kind of completely lost that idea of, of like being gentle about something. Like I'm going to approach subject matter that could be upsetting. So he's got this great consideration. Just as you were talking about taking an active approach, I just have this quote where he talks about four everyday duties will help me to achieve a healthier mental life. I must resolve first to strengthen and govern my body, nourishment, exercise, and discipline. Secondly, to feed and enlighten my intellect, serious, concentrated work. Thirdly, to elevate and control my heart, love of God and neighbor. And finally, to strengthen and exercise my will, decision and constancy. And it's just so full of this kind of paragraphs of wisdom that you want to put on the wall. But let's just talk about some of the exercises, like, you know, like walking consciously. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> some, some of these get into such a great level of detail that it was clear that he had employed these in his practice as a psychologist uh, to great effect, probably. And some of the exercises that I found most interesting were those of concentration. So mm. in towards the beginning of the book, on page 28, he actually gives figures that he encourages you to yeah. trace. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and, yeah. And this, you know, you'll feel probably a little silly doing it the first time, but it actually does. It works. It calms the brain. <laughs> and he gives an interesting story from his practice of a man who was suffering burnout at work. He was an executive and the psychologist prescribed him to get an aquarium of fish and put it in his office and spend one hour per day just staring at the fish and that's it. So he did this even though it felt weird and not only did he feel a greater mental stability and clarity but also he noticed that the fish were actually swimming in these patterns that mm. Father Irala has given us to trace. So these are patterns from nature created by God that just have this inherently calming and natural effect on the brain <laughs> and so repetition of these is is a way to ground you again and to to bring you back to earth and then another example is in this this chapter called how to rest he gives us some actual tips on how to get better sleep so he describes the resume on sleep he says we should <clears throat> Go to bed in a state of mental and emotional stasis. So that is, don't have any strong emotions before you try to sleep. Calm down. Don't be watching or engaging with any sort of media that would um, trigger any emotions. And then relax the muscles, beginning with the eyes, forehead, and jaw, all the way down to the toes, which we've heard of before. A rhythmic breathing exercise that he gives us. And then finally, paying attention to your breathing and to your relaxation. Uh, he has similar exercises for the voice, which is something I had not even considered could be actually <laughs> isolated as, as an exercise. But this mimics what we hear from the old subjects of rhetoric, right? Which is not taught in schools anymore, but they rhetoric. And then there's another one that I can't remember, but they would actually teach voice exercises mm -hmm. and, and singers probably still still experience this and do this yeah, voice but, and diction exercises mm -hmm. for people yeah. who use their voice a lot during the course of a day or have a lot of time uh, speaking on the telephone or in the course of their daily activity need to use their voice in excess he's got practical exercises for those people who who have that particular need in their day the use of their voice mm -hmm. it's really incredible and right. it's full like i found literally found like a focusing practice and I was like beautiful beautiful stuff and things that you can take into your own day and have a little index card with you and sit somewhere if you're stuck waiting online for something and mm -hmm. you can use these moments in your day you know to do stuff like that absolutely and one thing that especially when it comes to the focusing and concentration 
chapters is that he warns against multitasking, which I know is very difficult for modern sensibilities to hear, <laughs> but especially, I mean, he could not have predicted the iPhone and the, the millions of distractions that we're constantly assailed by, but he, he actually says that this diminishes the quality of work and the quality of rest. When you're trying to do them both at the same time, yeah. it doesn't work because your brain can't go in those two directions at the same time. So this is why he, he suggests, and there, there's a chart where he illustrates this of, you know, plateau of rest and then work, and then back down to rest and then work. Whereas most of us live in this wave in between where we're trying to simultaneously, you know, when we are relaxing and resting at home, we either have something on in the background that we're trying to stuff information into our brains, or we are on the phone or something like that. And then also when we're working, we're also listening to music or have some other sort of distraction. So we're never in one of those pure states. And I really like how he frames a lot of the book according to re-education, where he knows that the, the modern life has diminished these abilities in us. And so he starts you off very slow with these guided focuses uh, that occur just over the course, like, you know, less than a minute or so. And then you eventually build up to be able to sustain concentration over a longer period of time. So this is, is something that is really a maintenance manual to keep with you your entire life, because whether you are starting at the beginning of a process for even being aware of these things, or if it's something you've implemented already and worked on for a long time, his new perspective and his exercises will help you regardless of where you are on that spectrum. Yeah. And, you know, what did you take away from this whole discussion of peace? Because peace is in the title mm -hmm. and these lessons on how to relax. Right. Peace essentially is the state of the soul that accepts reality and orients towards the good. So he talks about unhappiness as really being caused by a dissonance between what is and what we think ought to be. Mm. And the acceptance, first of all, just of what we can change, what we cannot, and then of course, bringing it to prayer as well. And there's nothing wrong with prayers and petition, but knowing how to pray well and how to basically accept God's will, discern God's will in your life and be somewhat detached from reality as the saints teach us or not detached from reality, but detached from the material world, detached also from your emotions so that they do not control you yeah. in such a way that you are able to be okay regardless of what happens. And that's where the chapter, this is one of the longer ones in the book called Feelings and Emotions yeah. really comes in because he focuses on the extreme importance of being able to control your emotions and not be controlled by them. Yeah, and we kind of live in a world where, you know, feelings is everything, right, mm -hmm. right now. And this is written in a world where he's saying you've got to apply reason to feelings because acting out of pure emotion isn't an even state with which to approach a si mm -hmm. situation. So uh, it's it was really nice to revisit that because... A whole generations are being raised now on feelings and he, he kind of puts out there why we have to take our spirit and our very soul into account on everything. That's right. And emotions come from God. They are given to us as tools, but like our will, it can be used for good or evil. And the emotions and the imagination are also the realms in which the devil can play on us to try to influence our will. So that they're that first line of defense by which we experience the world mentally and emotionally, and then it conditions our decisions. And he would have been really well attuned to decisions that are made under the influence of extreme emotions as a confessor, especially, and how that modifies the degrees of culpability within our actions and how it can cause us to fall into sin mm -hmm. more often than not any sin, but especially in this book, the sin of despair, which feels like a feeling, but taken to the nth degree can actually turn into a sin, into a turning away from God's goodness. Yeah, I'm going to read this quote where he quotes uh, Carl Jung in the book. And uh, this is uh, from a 1932 quote, open quote. During the last 30 years, 
People have consulted me from all civilized regions of the world among all my patients in the second half of life, that is to say over 35. There has not been one whose problem in the last resort was that was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. It is safe to say that every one of them fell ill because he had lost that which living religions of every age have given to their followers and none of them has been really healed who did not regain his religious outlook. Close quote, mm -hmm. Carl Jung. Uh, I don't know that we would really, like that, that's the first quote that people love to put up from, uh, from him. But, um, right. <laughs> you know, he, he talks also in the book a lot about fear. And there are so many practical tools on how to face one's fears in this book. Can you talk about some of that? Sure. Yeah. So he defines fear, he de defines degrees of fear and ultimately tells us that fear is something that exists primarily in the imagination because fear is regarding the future. You can't fear something that has happened in the past, although you can, but it, it is just metaphysically something that's concerned with the future. So by that very fact, it's not real. It's not actually here yet. Uh, he also discusses the opposite effect where you're focusing too much on the past and regret and remorse to an extreme degree after you have, of course, been to confession and expiated for whatever you've done, or just pain left over from the past as also unreal in the same way, mm. and how an over-obsession with either the past or the future can lead us to these states of emotional imbalance with either regret, worry, or fear. So worry and anxiety are types of fear. They're, they're less extreme than a fear of an immediate stimulant stimulus, but they are still that fear instinct and being constantly in a fear instinct in a flight, in a fight or flight can actually cause what we know today as adrenal fatigue. Mm -hmm. So your hormones are actually activated to the point where the, it, it's unnatural to be this worried all the time. And your body is acting as if there is an actual source of fear in the room with you because of a worry that you have about the future so yeah if you if you conjure it up big enough in your imagination that lion or that thing that you're afraid of is present mm -hmm. with you and your body uh reacts uh physically starts to release the chemicals to to get you out of that danger or that situation mm -hmm. but you're right it does exactly. it builds in the imagination imagine Right. Like if you imagine even right now biting into a lemon, mm. you will start to feel <laughs> you'll start to feel that sourness and like your your body will react as if you are actually doing it. So our imagination has such power over our thoughts, emotions and then soul, which is somewhat terrifying, but also empowering because it means that you can have the power to to reverse course. So he gives us a couple of practical tips to overcome fear on pages 168 to 69. So throughout the book, he really is a proponent of action. So that is the first tip is before all else act because fear, as he says, already tends to inhibit our activities. So we must not assist it by remaining inactive, but on the contrary, conquer it by acting. And this is where the discussion of the will that he wrote earlier in the book becomes important too mm, because he speaks yeah. of exercising the will as necessary to human life because if we have a weak will then we are not truly acting in the in the free will that god gave us if our will if we're never able to make decisions if we vacillate constantly and can't really own our decisions be they good or bad in the moment then we it, it's a cause of unhappiness because we feel a lack of control over mm -hmm. our own life. So he recommends making small acts of the will throughout the day, even something like I am picking up this paper right now and just go through with it. Even, even though you could argue yourself out of it and say something like, Oh, should I really pick this up? Is it really the right thing to do right now? What would so-and-so think of it? You just have to do it. So <laughs> just do it is essentially the yeah. message of this. Unless it's sinful, you should be making decisions to, to strengthen the will just in small amoral matters. Um, and then 
he talks about a sort of a visualization. He says, make them concrete. That yeah. is your fears. So visualize, and there are many exercises to employ your fear either in a balloon and pop it or floating away from you or in perspective to something else. So rather than a nebulous creature living in the back of your mind, actually define what the fear is and what could actually happen, worst case and best case scenario. And then this next step, reason about them, which is kind of flowing from what we've just said, which is make a list of pros and cons and what is actually reasonable and realistic that could happen here. Hmm. And then finally, face up to them, which is easier said than done, but yeah. <laughs> takes the virtue of fortitude, and that's where we can we can pray to grow in this. And then he gives us some other reasons that we should avoid places and things that put us in a state of undue fear. So don't necessarily trigger yourself without reason um, by stepping into situations that you know will make you emotionally unstable, but also on the other hand, not to avoid life because of undue fear either. Sure. And he, again, uses this idea of a spectrum of you can gradually place yourself in more and more situations once you have exercised this muscle, so to speak. I think that's a key. And the emphasis with him is taking things slowly, like taking one's time, but moving all the time, like not getting caught in that inaction. You mentioned, I, I have a term, I call it no crastination, uh, mm -hmm. because I, when I've recognized I'm procrastinating on something, I try to now go, oh, no, I can't be doing that. I need to no crastinate that and move into some kind of action that's going to shift that thing. But just not letting things pile up too much. This is where perfectionism comes into, which he doesn't really speak of that much, but it's evident from this chapter that that's one of the barriers, that perfect is the enemy of the, the done <laughs> and the good. Yeah. And um, I think this kind of ties to scrupulosity, which he does talk about, which is almost, almost a moral perfectionism. Yeah. And the way that it just can paralyze you. Yeah. And the other thing I really like is that he talks about how to rest. And, mm -hmm. you know, who talks about rest in practical terms these days? You see a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I got to rest. I got to rest. And then they sit down and they stick a phone in their face. And that's right. <laughs> that's resting. Right. So mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned uh, insomnia earlier. Was there anything that you just off if you remember anything about rest that he was talking about? Well, I like how he breaks it down into bodily rest and then also mental rest mm. and how ideally in these periods of really high quality rest that we should be getting, it should be a combination of both bodily and mental rest at the same time. But also the idea of taking breaks from mental rest throughout work. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, again, where we get the concentration rest spectrum and the the importance just of just giving yourself a break and not guilting yourself for doing that and that can that can severely reduce the quality of the rest we get if we're constantly beating ourselves up for doing it um he also this is somewhat of a comfort to any insomniacs is that <laughs> he emphasizes the importance of rest regardless of whether or not you can actually sleep. And of course, sleep is very important. And he talks about that. But he also says, if you're unable to sleep, and you are just at that point where you've tried, which I know is counterintuitive, so hard, that mental rest can serve that function too, hmm. in that moment. And he, got, he does give some practical tips for uh, curing insomnia or, or you know, kind of lulling yourself to sleep. But also takes the pressure off and that helps you ironically actually fall asleep better because it's removing that mental cause oftentimes which is an anxiety and a getting within one's own head too much and the other thing is i employed some of that reading this book one of the things he suggests is to not read for more than 20 minutes and just mm -hmm. even if you put the book down for two minutes or five minutes and just mm -hmm. giving your eyes a rest or moving around the room and then coming back to it. I found that, that you retain a lot more doing these 20 minutes 
maximum of of reading. Whereas prior, you know, I could sit hours. The longer you go, the more there's an opportunity that you will drift in certain parts and forget passages of what you've been reading. You'll have gone through and quote read it, but not retained it. So anyone who's studying or has to have like uh, good study habits, this sort of 20 minutes on, a couple of minutes of a break, 20 minutes on, it's a much more practical approach to uh, those kinds of things. Yeah. And I like also that he differentiates between receptive and productive mental activity. Mm -hmm. And this would be the difference between consuming something, so reading, watching TV, taking in some sort of information versus producing, which would be work, analysis, and then also, interestingly, creative work. So often, and we've probably noticed this in our own lives, the those periods of rest and of leisure are often the inspiration of creative work where you are struck with your with creative ideas and your imagination is is allowed that breathing space to just formulate these ideas when you're not consciously thinking of them and so he emphasizes the importance of having a balance between these two types of mental activity and if we are uh, I think today we're probably more so too much reception because we're constantly ingesting media, for example, and doom scrolling, as they call it, on, on Twitter without taking time to fully integrate what we've seen and then also turn that into an activity. Yeah. And just on emotions, uh, there was a quote that I had pulled out, which I, you know, I think I'll just read here because it's just... Yeah. Probably people are getting the sense as we speak. It's like, I got to grab this book myself and really get into some of these <laughs> exercises because as we're going through them, I'm realizing, yeah, I want to I wanna come back to some of that ex- these exercises. But uh, here's, a, here's another quote. Quote, In the palace of feelings, there are brilliant halls where dwell optimism, hope, love, valor, and joy. And there are dark cellars. Lurking places of discouragement, sadness, fear, worry, and anger. The mistress of the palace, the will, has to pass through all its rooms, but can delay wherever she wishes. We should not give too much importance to fears or sadness when they come. We should not habitually and voluntarily stay with them, but pass on to the halls of joy and optimism." Close quote. It's such a beautiful image of what we should be receiving. You were just talking about that part of our mind and what we should be sort of letting go past us, right? And not dwelling in any of these places, recognizing them, having uh, the discernment. Many people can sort of linger on that tendency to go toward those sad feelings. But we can, in this volume, he teaches us, use an act of the will, and of course, it all comes around faith-based teaching. You know, so much of it also relies on having a spiritual component to your life so that there's a way to confront these things. Any thoughts on that? Definitely. I. That's a great quote. And in terms of sadness especially, it he discusses how the emotions can sometimes become our own enemies and they can trick us into perceiving a good that's not there or an evil that's not there. And so a combination of the emotions and fear, especially when the emotions have been so conditioned by the hormonal activation. So he speaks of first, the emotions have a muscular reaction Mm -hmm. where it's your initial knee jerk reaction to something that happens. And then, and this is based on patterns of what has happened in your life and how the hormones have been activated before. Once the adrenal response kicks in, it is so much harder to pull yourself out of that mindset and you need a really well-attuned will to be able to do that. And also a self-understanding of how this is not necessarily true. Your emotions could be lying to you and the devil could be using your emotions to tell you lies about yourself and about God. So in the, the, the chapter on sadness, doing these exercises to reframe 
your emotions often feels almost like a betrayal of your reality mm. because yes, your feelings are valid. They are happening. They are true. And they're oftentimes justified, but then you have to choose about whether or not you want to wallow, <laughs> even if something terrible has happened and that's objectively terrible and it's not your fault. You can choose to wallow forever and to die sad about the same thing for years that you can hold on to these feelings they will stay there or you can choose to just move on from them even though it feels wrong even though it feels that you are not being true to yourself by being true to these emotions which it takes us it's kind of taking a step outside of yourself that that feels a little dissonant at first but he he gives us um in this chapter on sadness some tips that include First, um, looking instead of on the unpleasant side, quote, he says, we see in it the light of faith. So again, understanding that suffering in this life can be turned around to bring joy in the next. And the second remedy he talks about is to foment thoughts of joy. So the idea that what we feed in our intellect and emotions will grow and what we starve will die. So giving opposite attention to the opposite feelings of joy fake it till you make it, smile even when you don't feel like it, actually does have a psychological impact on your mental health and the way you feel. And then he says to talk about changing negative habits and attitudes. So again, thinking of emotions as something that become habits and become patterns that we fall into, the ability that we have to divert ourselves from this. And he does recommend distraction. So when we're concentrating, distraction is not good, but when you are stuck in an emotion and just can't get out of it, distraction is fine, even if it's something ridiculous, if it serves to break that pattern. Yeah, that's another force of the will. It's such a... I just the emphasis, too, is just having faith as a component or cornerstone to all of this, because it becomes the focal point from which virtue and everything else can can grow out of and this volume is so i enjoyed it so much because it takes that into consideration and then of course then things become rightly ordered out of all of that there's there's a structure whereas some other approaches aren't as structured and uh very often to find our way out of these places there has to be a very structured approach Mm -hmm. And he ends the book with a chapter called Choice of Vision for One's Life and describes that, and of, of course we know that he likely had some non-Catholic patients as well, and he, he frames this in that, in just, at, in first natural law terms of the nature of an ideal, what an ideal contains. It contains an intellectual element employing the mind, the feeling element employing the emotions, and then the acts of the will bringing that all together and how there are false ideals and true ideals and how without the true ideal, that is a life lived for Christ, everything else will crumble underneath. And the importance of not over-focusing on these exercises and these practical tips at the expense of the big picture, because doing all of these exercises can only get you so far if the soul itself is not healthy and ultimately we won't be happy unless our soul is given what it needs. And that is intimacy with God and working towards the good, the true, the beautiful. So having an ideal at the top, having God at the top, everything else will fall into order. Whereas if you idolize or put anything at the top that isn't God, even if it is a good in and of itself, be that family or your own career or emotions or even your own desire for good things on this earth, those things are good in and of themselves, but when they're made idols, then the structure still crumbles because where is the room for God in that hierarchy? That's such a beautiful place to close out. And he emphasizes also always to speak with people who are well-versed and understand these things. Uh, if you are in a place where you do need to heal, and we all do in some way after... Uh, after this whole situation that we've lived through and everything, that you do it kind of in a rightly ordered way. Exactly. And 
Right. Ultimately, we can speak to friends and therapists, but the only one who truly understands our heart is Jesus. And he's the only one with whom true intimacy and knowledge of the other person and closeness and understanding and love is possible. And that's actually a really freeing realization because it allows you to move through life knowing that friendships and relationships are good, but that they are not the people who will ultimately be able to fulfill you in, in the way that you were designed and created for. So you're able to better put everyone and everything in perspective in the supernatural order. And then really an inner peace comes from that understanding. The book is Peace Be With You. My guest today has been Kristen Van Uden. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. God bless. God bless you. Check us out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, our website, thefocusingway.com.